it's a it's a real honor to uh, to uh, give these uh, lectures, and I, I really uh, appreciate uh, the invitation. Thank you. So I will be talking about the uh, uh, Navier-Stokes uh, equation. This is uh, the equation. Uh, the unknown function is a, a vector field u in a uh, in a domain, and uh, uh, at the boundary one imposes the uh, condition that u is zero if uh, the viscosity is positive and uh, that if the viscosity nu here is uh, zero then one just imposes that the uh, normal component uh, is uh, zero and uh, the the equation is uh, just expresses the newton's law force is uh, mass times uh, acceleration here, this uh, term here is the acceleration, and uh, these terms here, they uh, represent uh, force divided by mass. This, uh, these are the forces due to the incompressibility in the fluid, and uh, these are the forces due to the inner friction in the fluid. And uh, uh, in many cases, uh, for example, for water and for air, the, the viscosity is uh, very low. This is uh, in the values in SI unit. So it makes sense to, uh, to consider the Euler equation when the, uh, when the friction is zero. So let's consider a classical problem. We have a ball of radius R, which is moving through the fluid at the velocity U and we want to calculate uh, the drag force, the, the resistance force. So this was considered already by Newton in uh, his Principia in uh, 1687, uh, but we start with Stokes, okay? And uh, Newton was considering a, a little different approach, but let's start uh, with Stokes, which is directly related to the uh, equation. So, what Stokes was able to calculate, uh, so it's uh, the, the, the ball goes through the, uh, through the fluid. We can also think the ball as stationary and impose some uh, condition at infinity that uh, velocity field is constant at infinity. And uh, Stokes was able to calculate uh, the solution for a very small, or I, I should say infinitesim infinitesimally small u. So what he really calculated is the derivative of this force at zero. And uh, that uh, amounts to solving the linearized equation, you just drop the nonlinear term with the right uh, boundary condition. And it turns out uh, it's, it's a remarkable calculation. You can solve it explicitly in terms of uh, sines and cosines and some fractions. And this is the formula in, in that case, uh, six pi rho nu r u. So historically, the, uh, the formula has been important, including, uh, including this uh, factor here, six pi, because for example, Einstein in his famous paper on uh, uh, diffusion, he, he was comparing uh, some uh, 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 values of the Boltzmann constant with some diffusivity coefficients. And in, in that uh, case, the, this value here is uh, plays a role. So the derivative we can uh, compute or uh, when u is very small, we have uh, a very good solution. But when we go to, to say finite uh, values of uh, u's, is uh, we don't really expect to be able to, uh, to do a numerical calculation. But nevertheless, we can, uh, we can just uh, put things on a computer and, uh, and do a, a computer simulation. A good thing in this case is that we have a reasonable theory that uh, at least when u is small, we know that there exists a smooth steady state solution, which is unique for small values of u. So it's important uh, to know that uh, the target of our uh, calculation is a smooth object, right? It's a smooth function which we want to calculate. And uh, we can do that. On the left here, you have, uh, you have uh, uh, the experimental uh, pictures. I should have said probably the, the, what does it small mean in this context? Uh, so you, it's, it's good 
to say small relative to what. So the, this quantity here called the Reynolds number, it ex, it's a dimensionless quantity. So that means it's uh, independent of the choice of our unit. So small u for us essentially means, means small Reynolds number. So in this business, say uh, Reynolds number five or 10 is considered small. Okay, so, so that's uh, uh, in that range, for example, the Stokes formula uh, works, uh, works very well. So these are the pictures here you have the, th these are probably 100 years old uh, pictures or maybe even more. Uh, here you have the Reynolds numbers, here you have uh, how the flow looks behind uh, the ball. And indeed, when you do this calculation uh, on, a, on a computer, it, uh, you, it reproduces uh, this picture. Uh, everything is fine, the drag force is coming, coming out nicely. So essentially, the equation is doing its job. Uh, it exactly uh, predicts what, uh, what you see in, uh, in uh, experiments. Now, when you go to still larger Reynolds numbers, say into the hundreds, 200, 300, 500, and so on, which of course, if you, if you think, so, so because the, the, remember the Reynolds number, it's a ratio R times U divided by nu. A nu can be like 10 to the minus five. So with everyday objects, you get to the hundreds of thousands very easily. Okay, so, so the, the, for practical, if you are talking about say a car, you're talking easily about millions of uh, Reynolds numbers. So uh, hundreds is not really a very large uh, Reynolds number. But if you get into this uh, range, like hundreds and so on, you, you still get on your computer, if you, if you start doing your calculations, say axisymmetric uh, 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 steady state uh, solution, you still get a very nice uh, picture of uh, the solution, but you, you realize that something is wrong with the, the picture. So what is happening that this recirculation regions here are becoming very large. The, the force is becoming uh, unrealistically small, small. One still has a bona fide solution of the Navier-Stokes equation, which uh, you get from the computer. But uh, the problem is the solution is unstable in the, which one calculates is unstable. In the dynamical sense, if we think Navier-Stokes uh, as a dynamical system like this, we linearize around our steady state solution, look at, uh, look at the linearized operator, look at the spectrum. Then uh, what happens is that uh, the, some eigenvalues will cross from the, uh, across the imaginary axis into, and the real part becomes positive and the solution loses stability. So what will happen is that, uh, in, that uh, you will see some oscillations in the field and so on. So the, uh, the, the loss of stability here uh, is due to Hopf bifurcation. The, the, the first uh, eigenvalues which cross are crossing away from zero on the imaginary axis. And therefore you don't get any warning that you, from the steady state simulation. You do some continuation in the steady state computation. Everything looks fine. Everything is invertible, okay, because no, at least in the beginning, no real eigenvalues are crossing. So, so the, the steady state solution doesn't see that. You really have to, uh, you really have to look at the spectrum. And uh, here is an example of a calculation uh, by, by Kim and Perlstein uh, from around 1990. And here, here is the picture. So when you do this uh, calculation, you, the, the, your object around which you linearize is a, uh, is a uh, uh, symmetric, it's an axisymmetric solution, which is steady state. So you can, when you do the, uh, the linearized analysis, you can decompose in the Fourier modes in the rotation around the axis. And uh, it turns out the first unstable mode is uh, when uh, in the in the first uh, in the first uh, Fourier mode, not in the zeroth Fourier mode. So the the bifurcation happens to non-axisymmetric uh, solution. So already at the first instability, the axisymmetry is is broken, and the the wake starts oscillating 
in a, in a non axisymmetric uh, non axisymmetric way and here you see the the pair of uh, uh, complex conjugate eigenvalues related to that mode uh, approaching uh, approaching zero and it crosses uh, so these authors report Reynolds number about 175, which kind of uh, agrees with uh, what one sees in experiments. So they then, as you, so, so, so this is a picture which you see this, this wake starts oscillating and then further eigenvalues cross. So we see more oscillations and there is this uh, standard picture that as you increase the Reynolds number more and more, eigenvalues cross, you see more and more oscillations resulting to turbulence. And in the 70s, people realized you can not only have like periodic and quasi-periodic solutions, but you can have strange attractors and uh, uh, all this. So th there is all this uh, uh, theory uh, around it. And uh, very soon you get into the region where even if you have a big computer, you can simply not calculate. You see already here, this is probably Reynolds number in tens of thousands or maybe hundred thousand, something like that. And uh, you see the, the fine structure, they are oscillating very fast. So it, it becomes really difficult uh, to do num numerics, but uh, I think uh, one can say that as far as we can do the calculations, the results of the calculations agree with, uh, with experiments. I think everybody has seen pictures like this. Uh, this is not full uh, Navier-Stokes calculation. In these uh, regimes to resolve Navier-Stokes fully, it's, it's hopeless, uh, even if you have huge computers, here, what one uh, has to do is modeling. You, you simply replace the equation by some averaging of, uh, of high Fourier modes or something like that. So one doesn't really solve the Navier-Stokes. It's, uh, of course, very practical and, and uh, fascinating uh, area. And people have uh, come up with a lot of very clever tricks. But uh, in this talk, I will focus on the, on the theory. So what would we what would you like to show on the on the theoretical side in this uh, in this context? So a reasonable conjecture based on uh, uh, experiments and computations is that in this problem uh, in this particular problem of uh, flow around a cylinder for sufficiently large Reynolds number the flow becomes unstable. Okay, that at some point. When you look at this, uh, when you look at the spectrum, you cross. As far as I know, this has not been proved. So, uh, so strictly speaking, from the from the rigorous uh, uh, from the point of view of rigorous analysis, this is uh, still a conjecture. Even uh, I think that everybody believes this is uh, a correct uh, conjecture. The good news for the for the computation and possibly for something like uh, say a computer assisted uh, proof in this case is that all our object which we need to to prove this conjecture are smooth functions okay so so you don't have to deal with any suspicious functions everything is smooth uh, including in in theory we can prove that there exists solution the solution is smooth and so on so the, the objects of our interest here are smooth functions and we know they are smooth. So that's make, that makes the, all the computation and the theory kind of uh, reasonable. Now, once we go into this oscillatory regime in, uh, in after the hop bifurcation, maybe if when the oscillations are small, I think it's an interesting problem which should, I'm not sure if it uh, has been done. If you can show, say, in this uh, 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 regime just after the Hopf bifurcation that you have these periodic solutions there and maybe you can follow them a little bit if you increase the number, of the, this, you are able to show maybe that there are some periodic solutions. But as, uh, as more and more of these uh, eigenvalues cross, or even if you get into some uh, large beyond small perturbation theory, it's, uh, 
we don't know that they are good solutions. Okay, that's uh, that's the problem that uh, we we don't even know uh, based on our uh, theory that uh, good solutions uh, exist. So the the first uh, bifurcation is to non-axisymmetric solutions. So you lose your axisymmetry uh, immediately after the bifurc after the bifurcation. But even if one said, okay, let's stay in the class of axisymmetric solution. Interestingly enough, even in that case, once you get into oscillating solutions, we don't know the solution is regular. So there is a general, if, if there are no obstacles, uh, no boundaries, then in, if we have this, the situation so-called axisymmetric without swirl, then we can prove regularity. If we didn't break this axisymmetry and the swirl component is zero, that, that this goes back to Yudovich and Ladishenskaya you can prove regularity. But in this case, you have the obstacle. So even if you assume that the solution is axisymmetric without swirl, here at these points where the boundary meets the axis of rotation, the regularity theory uh, is uh, unable uh, with the current method to prove regularity. So even in the simplified scenario, we don't know they are good solutions. And uh, the significance of singularity is essentially in that it, uh, it may break uniqueness. So after a singularity, one may, we don't know, but uh, potentially one can lose uniqueness. And once you lose uniqueness, then it's not even clear how this, uh, how this uh, drag force is defined because you, you have these oscillations behind the cylinder. Sometimes maybe there is a singularity now and then after the singularity, you don't know which solution to choose if you if you lose uniqueness. So F actually, uh, by uh, what we know, we cannot really say that uh, F, the drag force, is a well-defined macroscopic uh, quantity. So let's uh, let's look at uh, let's look at uh, a simpler situation at the at the classical Cauchy problem when we have uh, when we have no boundary. So, so this is a cartoon picture of uh, the space time. Uh, we have uh, the initial condition uh, u zero, which uh, this is the velocity field at time zero that uh, gives the full uh, information about uh, the system. And uh, we want to predict uh, uh, how it will develop. So we want to use the equation to predict uh, the, the future. And uh, for a while, this can be done for, uh, for at least a short time. We know that there exists a, a good uh, local smooth uh, solution, which is uh, unique. So that goes back to Ozin in 1911. We cannot rule out that, uh, that a singularity uh, appears, but in uh, 1930s, Larre uh, figured out a way to pass the solution through the singularity and uh, defined uh, uh, what we call weak solution after the singularity. The weak solution uh, is still can become smooth again and then maybe there is another singularity and so on. So there is the, a nice theory of uh, these uh, weak solutions. Uh, and the best available weak solutions, uh, we have partial regularity theory for them, starting with Schaeffer and uh, Kaffarelli called Nuremberg and uh, further simplifications of, uh, of the proof. Um, so we have uh, nice uh, solutions which are uh, regular on a, on a very large set. The set of uh, singularity is, is very small, but the bad news is that even a one point singularity, if in the, say, like in this cartoon picture, we don't know how to prove uniqueness, even with one point singularity. So for all we know, even a one point singularity can destroy uniqueness. And then of course, uh, the equation no longer predicts what will happen after. So from that point of view, the, the Navier-Stokes model is incomplete if, if that would be the scenario, the model would be incomplete because it uh, would not do uh, exactly what it was uh, designed to do to predict uh, the future. So I have to get a little technical at, uh, at this point because I want to get to some, uh, to, to what we know 
about uh, about uh, these uh, solutions and so so as it as it happens one has to be uh, a little careful with the definitions of uh, the the weak solutions and uh, and uh, the classes in in which we consider them so this is the equation i wrote it in in this form where all the all the derivatives are taken out uh, uh, so so that you can uh, if you test by a smooth function you can move these derivatives to uh, to the test function so you see to make sense in this in uh, distributions all you need is the, is that uh, this term this is the most dangerous term here a u a tensor u that this is integral so th that's a one very natural class is uh, is uh, this class uh, L2 of space time. The next class is uh, say finite kinetic energy, uniformly bounded kinetic energy, L infinity L2. Okay, that's a nice, uh, very natural class. The next class is finite energy and finite dissipation. When you write the energy inequality for the function, so that's a very natural, uh, common sense inequality that the energy at uh, the initial time is the energy at uh, a later time plus the energy dissipated in between. So we want all these quantities to be finite. That's a very natural energy class for the function. And then you, th there are some inequalities here. So this, uh, there are some inequalities in this uh, energy class. And if you impose these uh, inequalities, uh, for example, that the energy at uh, T1 is uh, larger than the energy at T2. So you get this class with some uh, inequalities. That's the so-called Larry Hopf class. And if you localize them even more, you get the class of uh, suitable uh, weak solutions. So all these classes are, are related to, to energy uh, inequalities and making sense of the equation. And then there is the so-called Ladyzhenskaya Prodisserian class that's related to a different uh, method that's related to perturbation theory. That's when we treat the, the nonlinear term in a perturbative way and we want to, uh, and we want to uh, prove things. Uh, it turns out that uh, this is exactly the class when, uh, when the perturbation, the, the borderline for uh, perturbation theory. So the, the perturbation theory, it goes back to, to Larray, but it really, from a more sophisticated uh, viewpoint, it, was, uh, it, uh, it, it goes back to Cato and then the, the, the French school and many other, uh, many other people uh, contributed uh, to it. I, I will mention the, the result of uh, uh, Koch and Tataru, where they studied uh, the 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 best or or the, the local well posedness of uh, this equation from the point of view of perturbation theory you assume you have some initial data mu and you you want to see uh, what uh, which is the, uh, the the good space in which you can uh, still locally define the solution so so they they came up with a very elegant solution in which uh, one combines the two uh, basic things about uh, the equation. So you you saw previously in this uh, in this list this uh, sorry this is uh, I need to go back. Uh, this uh, space of L two uh, of L two uh, space time function right that's the minimal requirement uh, you need to define the solution, and then you have the scale invariance, okay? That's another important uh, scaling symmetry of this equation. And uh, if you combine those two, you take this L2 space-time uh, space and you try to make it scale invariant, you arrive naturally at a certain space, which turns out to be exactly the space of uh, heat solution extension of initial data, which are in BMO minus one. Okay, so if you don't do harmonic analysis, BMO is like something similar to L infinity. So, so BMO minus one would be like derivatives of uh, bounded functions. They are definitely uh, contained there. And, uh, and the result there is that 
Once the norm in this is small, you have uh, global uh, well positiveness, and there are uh, other results which you can uh, which you can derive from it. For example, if you are in VMO minus one, you have local well positiveness, and so on. And the special case of this is uh, is uh, the forward self similar solution. So the uh, important uh, thing about this uh, this uh, perturbation theory approach is that uh, it's it looks uh, it it does not really use uh, too much uh, the the uh, the energy inequality of the equation. And in fact, it, uh, it does not use the structure of the equation uh, too much. One would think, okay, maybe the assumption that, uh, that BMO minus one norm has to be small or some other the, the local in time or some difficulties which we have in perturbation theory, maybe they are coming from the fact that, uh, that we are not using the uh, equation sufficiently but uh, what I will try to argue, argue that this is not really, really the case, that these perturbation theory results, at least when you, when you look at them from the point of view of well posedness in the, in the non-smooth functions, that they are actually optimal. Um, so uh, weak solutions, uh, it's not known if they are regular, uh, uh, weak solutions uh, are not known to be unique, and it is not known if the strong solutions uh, develop uh, singularities. At some point uh, in the past, maybe people could have hoped that, uh, that uh, this class of uh, ener solutions with finite energy, so, so the uh, if I go to my list of, uh, of uh, spaces that uh, this class, that you have a finite energy solution. So a very optimistic uh, conjecture would be that every weak solution in this class is uh, smooth and therefore unique uh, and so on. Th that might have looked at some point as a, as a kind of nice, uh, nice conjecture that somehow the, the properties of the equation would be so good that it would uh, enforce uh, this. But unfortunately, uh, this is not the case. That uh, the, it was uh, quite recently, in fact, by in 2017, by Tristan Bookmaster and, and Vladvico, they showed non-uniqueness in this class and, and uh, not uh, irregularity. Uh, and in fact, their class is e even a little bit uh, better than, uh, than uh, just the finite energy. There, there is uh, uh, this uh, uh, extra uh, regularity that, uh, which goes in the, in the right direction. So in the energy class, we would like to have S is equal to one that is still open, but at least we know we can have some, uh, some positive S. And, uh, Another recent result is by uh, 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 Tao Luo and uh, Alex Cheskidov, where they show that these classes, these LPQ classes, these uh, Ladizhenskaya producing classes, at least in the case of, uh, of uh, L is equal to, of Q is equal to infinity are optimal. And uh, I should also mention that uh, there is a lot of uh, great results on uh, Euler equation, the case uh, nu is equal to zero related to uh, the resolution of the, of the Onsager, uh, Onsager conjecture, but uh, in this talk I will, I will focus on, uh, on Navier's talks. So now I want to get back to the connection to, to computation. So uh, what uh, with uh, the help of a computer uh, computation similar to, to, what, uh, to what we saw in the beginning for the flow around the ball, and I will talk about it uh, in, uh, in more detail, we can uh, show modulo of the results of uh, coming from this, uh, from this uh, computation that essentially that all these results 
of uh, perturbation theory as far as uh, well-posedness and uniqueness and so on in these classes of uh, smooth functions or, or non-smooth functions are concerned are optimal. So what seems to be the case modulo, so, so it is a conjecture uh, in the sense that we need to verify some spectral values, like in the sense that the instability of the flow around the ball is also a conjecture, right? We cannot quite uh, prove it uh, rigorously. Uh, so here, what uh, if uh, you, you will see, I will, I will mention the spectral computation, but if the spectral computation uh, is taken uh, as a, uh, as, as a valid result, then we can show that, uh, that the equation is actually, uh, so, so let, let me specify what, uh, what we have. We, so we have initial datum, which is smooth away from uh, the origin, okay? It has singularity, roughly speaking, like one over X at uh, the origin. It's, it's, a, it's a smooth, vector. It's, it's a vector field. So, so this is just the estimate. The derivative behaves exactly like derivatives of uh, one over x. It's compactly supported. So you, you see it's, it is in BMO minus one. If this constant C is small, you have global uh, wall posedness by Koch and Tataru. But if it is large, you don't. You have actually a local in ill posedness. So in that sense, the, the result of uh, Koch and Tataru and all the uniqueness results, which people have proved, like weak strong, strong uniqueness results, which people have proved uh, before, they seem to be optimal. Which uh, to me, when, when uh, we uh, first saw this, it, it looked kind of surprising because these, many of these results like Ladizhenskaya, Prodiserin classes, they, they go back into 1960s, right? The, the modern harmonic analysis like BMO minus one, it came later, but, uh, but the spirit kind of that, that this perturbation theory can, you can prove uniqueness and, uh, and you need some assumptions for that, that goes uh, way back. And it seems that all these results are actually optimal, that the equation does not give you more special structure to handle at least these solutions which are not smooth. I'm not talking about smooth initial data. That may be, that may be we don't know there yet, but at least it's as, far as, uh, as far as rough initial data go, then the, the, the methods which treat the non-linearity just as perturbation without really using too much of the structure, they give you the optimal result. You can also look at it uh, the, the other way in, in the sense that, uh, that the, Navier, the, the, the Navier Stokes is, uh, is kind of almost behave like, behaves like a general nonlinearity in a certain sense. Okay, so we use, uh, we use uh, uh, this uh, ansatz of, uh, of uh, uh, the forward uh, self-similar solutions and uh, the calculation which we have to do in the end is very similar to what one has to do for the calculation uh, for the uh, instability of the flow around the ball. So this is our equation. That's the equation for self-similar solution. You get this extra term there, which looks in, in the end, I mean, um, it, it looks a bit uh, dangerous because there is this unbounded, uh, unbounded uh, uh, coefficient here, but this, Part, it's really an Ornstein Uhlenbeck operator. So it's not, uh, it's actually uh, helping. It, it, it make, it's making the progress, uh, the, the, the term more like uh, an equation on a bounded domain. So, so this actually is, is helping. Then you have the nonlinearity. And then you, you want to solve it with, with some boundary condition at infinity which is given, so, so in our calculation, it's given by a very explicit uh, function like that. So, so which is a pure swirl. It's a pure swirl condition, very explicit uh, uh, function. Uh, everything here in these coefficients is roughly speaking of order one. So you can consider mu, the coefficient mu in front of it essentially as, as your Reynolds number. And uh, 
the, the question becomes, there, there is some theory which one needs to develop around that. And the question becomes if the eigenvalues will cross the imaginary axis, okay? Very similar to the calculation uh, uh, for, for the ball. And an important point here is that all the objects which we are focusing on, which we need, are smooth objects, okay? Here we are not dealing with any kind of singular solutions uh, or anything. All the objects, just like in the flow around the ball when we were calculating the instability here, we are dealing with smooth objects. So that's, uh, that's of course, good news for uh, computer simulation. And the result is, indeed that, uh, that uh, the, so the eigenvalues cross. And there are many similarities with this uh, calculation of uh, the eigenvalues for, for, the, uh, for the flow around the ball. So here, when mu is equal to zero, so that's when, when we start, uh, like in the Stokes problem for very small uh, velocities, we have an explicit solution. That's when in, in our equation, in the ornstein willenbeck operator, when you can neglect the nonlinear term, you can solve everything explicitly. Okay, the, the, you have Hermit polynomials. It's related to uh, to eigenfunctions of uh, quantum oscillator. You you have explicit formulas and you have explicit eigenvalues: 1.5, 2, 2.5, 3, and so on. So this this is a numerical simulation. We were not putting in uh, this exact formulas by hand. This is how it came up from, uh, from the numerical simulation. And uh, so, so you see it agrees. Uh, and then we continue, just like when you do the Stokes, uh, uh, the, the flow around the ball, you continue. This eigenvalue stays constant. There, there is a conservation law in the equation which enforces that. But we, we first saw that it was constant. And then what we were trying to explain why it was constant with the help of uh, Hao Jia, we figured out that uh, there is uh, this uh, conserved uh, quantity there. And uh, again, all the objects in these calculations are smooth. And you see the, the uh, eigenvalue crosses at about uh, 300, just before 300. So even the numerical value like for the ball, for the flow around the ball, you have 990 or something like that. Here we have about 300. So it, it looks quite similar to this uh, calculation of instability uh, for the flow around the ball. These are some uh, pictures uh, of the solution. I should say that the comp computation were done by uh, Julien Guillaume. Uh, and uh, these are some pictures of uh, the solution. So what happens is that uh, the solution loses. So, so, so it's, a, it's a classical pitchfork bifurcation. You have axis symmetry, you have a Z2 symmetry, and, uh, and uh, uh, at some point when the bifurcation happens, the Z2 symmetry is, is broken. And you can see it maybe in this picture a little bit that uh, the, the Z2 symmetry is essentially the symmetry of the solution around this axis, uh, reflection around this axis. And uh, this is bro uh, broken. You, you see that it's kind of tilting in, uh, in one direction. So the superficial resemblance of uh, this uh, bifurcation is with buckling. Like if you have a beam and you put force on the beam, okay, there is one solution when the beam stays straight, right, uh, when you put force on it, and there is another solution when the beam buckles like that. So in some sense, the, the, so what one sees in this solution is that it is, uh, it is buckling like that. Okay, so that's uh, the Navier Stokes. So the conclusion from, from that is that uh, at least when we are dealing with non-smooth initial data, then uh, the perturbation theory gives what it seems it gives optimal results if we believe this, uh, if we believe this uh, computation. We don't really have good candidates uh, for the case when we start with uh, non-smooth data. Okay, there we, there we don't really uh, have uh, good candidates. There are some, uh, some speculations about what would be uh, the, the, 
what should happen. One good conjecture is that uh, all the instabilities are unstable and uh, there, is a, uh, there is a dense set of initial data from which, uh, from which uh, the solution uh, is indeed smooth. So there we, we don't really know what happens for Navier-Stokes for smooth uh, data, but we have a better idea maybe for Euler equation for the, for the case when uh, the viscosity is zero, which is a little bit uh, different uh, theory. So that's what I would, uh, that's what uh, I would like to discuss next. But you will see that th there will be a difference between the calculations which I was talking about up to now, where our target, where uh, targets were smooth functions, right? So we, uh, we feel very good about these uh, calculations because you, you really uh, dealing with these functions all the time. Now for Euler, it, uh, you, you'll see it's, it's a little different, but still, uh, still interesting, I think. So, so in uh, 2013, there was an important uh, development in, in this numerical simulations for Euler equation when uh, Guo Luo and Tom Hao uh, came up with a new uh, singularity scenario, which uh, I may call say HL singularity. And they, uh, they uh, identified a very plausible scenario for singularity uh, formation, which had the advantage that it was uh, at the same time simple and, uh, and robust. And uh, it or, although their initial uh, conjecture about singularity formation has not been proved rigorously yet, it already had uh, important impact on, uh, on theoretical developments. For example, it was, uh, it was uh, used, the, the scenario uh, was used to the proof of double exponential growth for the gradient uh, in the Euler equation, then for singularity formation, uh, for the proof of singularity formation with, in domains with boundaries, I should, I should say, for modified SQG patches. And a, it also played a part in, uh, I, I mean, there in, in the recent work of Tarek Elgindi uh, on uh, the finite time blow up uh, on C1 alpha solutions, there were many uh, new ideas, but uh, one of them uh, can be related to, uh, to this uh, singularity scenario of uh, Guo Luo and, uh, and Tom Hao. And uh, it's, uh, uh, I should also mention uh, recently that uh, it's uh, C1 alpha version where the initial data is not smooth, uh, but C1 alpha was recently proved rigorously using the ideas of Elgindi by Jia Jia Chen and, and uh, Tom Hao. So, and, and there were other, uh, other uh, actual in, in development. So, so this is an example when, when a numerical simulation really, I, I think, uh, had, a, a, had a significant impact on, uh, on theoretical uh, considerations. So let me, let me talk a little bit about uh, the, the singularity. So it's, uh, it's uh, good to, uh, to, to, to mention the, the geometry behind it. Uh, and, uh, it goes uh, that goes back to uh, to a paper of uh, to a paper of Einstein from uh, from 1926, uh, which uh, uh, which uh, uh, its uh, its goal was to explain some things about uh, rivers, but uh, he also addressed the question why in if you if you stir your cup of tea with the tea leaves in it, why the tea leaves gather at the bottom. Okay, so here is his uh, explanation. So the, when, you, when you imagine that the, that, the, uh, w that the fluid rotates as a, as a rigid body, there will be an equilibrium between uh, centrifugal forces in the fluid and the pressure. 
Okay, so the pressure due to incompressibility, it will counter the centrifugal force and uh, everything will be at equilibrium. However, at the bottom of the, of the, uh, of, uh, the teacup, there is friction, so, so there is not as much rotation here at uh, the bottom, and so, so there is a deficit of the centrifugal force. Right? So he argues that the pressure is kind of uh, distributed uh, uh, kind of more uniformly. It's, it's a hand-waving argument, but a, a fairly convincing one. And, uh, and uh, therefore, the, here, the, the pressure, I mean, in the first approximation, you can assume will be kind of constant uh, along here. And therefore, it will be, you will have excess force near the bottom in this direction. So the, the fluid has to start moving. And this is how it will move. Okay. So that's the motion which, uh, which he uh, uh, explained. Uh, there was uh, in the next, so, so this was an article in uh, Naturwissenschaften. Uh, and in the next uh, in the next issue of the journal, there is a there is a letter by uh, by Prantl, where he says uh, that uh, that uh, something like here that these considerations uh, have not been unknown to experts, and he uh, he quotes uh, a paper from uh, 1877 by uh, James uh, Thompson, so. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's not uh, it's not a new argument. Interestingly enough, uh, uh, there was uh, there was uh, which I uh, uh, came across uh, completely by accident. Uh, th there was a paper in New York Times about uh, the article of Einstein. Okay, they they uh, wrote about uh, his uh, contribution to the theory of meandering rivers and. Uh, for a small fee, you can download the article from uh, the, from New York Times. Uh, so here is uh, the situation in uh, in uh, uh, Tom Howe and uh, Guo Luo situation. Very similar to what we have in this uh, in this uh, uh, teacup. So you have rotation here. You have rotation here in the opposite direction. If there is a sharp transition, discontinuity, it's an equilibrium. It's, a, it's an exact solution of the Euler equation, but we make it less sharp by say taking a smooth interpolation. And then it's the same story. There is, uh, there is uh, a lack of centrifugal force in, uh, in this direction. So the excess of pressure, the, the uh, fluid has to start moving. The points which are at the boundary have to stick at the boundary. If in the first approximation, you assume the, the pressure is constant, you immediately see there will be a boundary uh, singularity because uh, you get essentially like a Burgess equation if you assume that, uh, that the pressure is constant as, as in this hand-waving argument. Of course, in reality, it's not constant. So you have to do a simulation and that's what Tom Howe and Guo Luo did. And uh, it seems you see a singularity. They very carefully uh, very carefully documented that. And here is another thing to, to support this. Uh, for example, so, so in, in these uh, developments, which I mentioned like exponential, double exponential growth for 2D Euler or modify SQG patches or, or the, the, uh, uh, the, the result of uh, Tarek Elgindi. Let's, let's look at uh, the first one. So this is, uh, this is Euler equation. 2D Euler, you, you give it the same uh, kind of flow geometry. You give it a spin in this direction, you give it a spin in this direction, and the points at the boundary are coming here. And the advantage, the strength of this, uh, the robustness of uh, this uh, scenario is that you can do a very good uh, estimate of the Biot-Savart law, okay? Essentially, you are able to, to calculate U in this, for the leading term is a linear field with some modulating factor, which you control in the in critical region, it looks like that. And uh, you get this equation, 
okay, which uh, of course gives you double exponential uh, growth. You approach this point in a double exponential way. And this is just pure Euler, okay? You have no help from rotation, no help from, uh, from uh, some uh, weight or anything. So, so already 2D Euler almost blows up, right? It just barely kind of uh, keeps uh, regularity. So when you, when you modify this to SQG patches, you get even stronger term here, which, uh, uh, which makes these particles to collide. And uh, the, the element of uh, Tarek's work on, on blow up is that he's also able to identify uh, a good way to approximate the Beal Savar law again by a, linear, uh, by a linear field with some modulating factor. And using that and many other novel ideas, he, he manages to do something which people have been uh, trying to do for a, for a long time at the end, and there have been arguments for that, that if you look at Euler like this, this is omega, this is uh, a linear operator of zero order on omega, so maybe it looks like a Riccati equation, okay? And so, so with this approximation and many other tricks, uh, 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 Elgindi was really able to prove that in some sense that indeed you have a, a Riccard equation in this Euler. Up to some approximation, he was able to show that indeed uh, in this C1 alpha class, there is a Riccard equation inside. And, and the scenario, the, there is some kind of robustness to this scenario. That's why it is important. So with Guo Luo, our question was, what happens after the singularity, right? You have, uh, you, the singularity appears uh, at the boundary. And just like for Navier-Stokes, uh, you can uh, try to continue the solutions uh, as weak solutions, okay? There, there is, uh, as, long as, your, as long as your field, U, is, uh, is in L2, you, you can continue it uh, as, uh, as uh, the weak solution. And uh, I should mention that there is a that there is a analogy between uh, this uh, axisymmetric rotational uh, uh, solutions and the Businesque equation. In the Businesque equation, it's essentially two D equation where the fluid you 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 can think about it as light and heavy fluid, right? The the fluid has that's one way to think about it has variable density. So you can have a patch of, of heavy fluid on which the, on which the uh, gravity acts. Okay, so that brings some of these additional forces. We have seen that for oil, you already have, uh, it almost just barely avoids uh, blow up. If you bring in some additional forces like this, like uh, from uh, the Businesque, the, the role of this weight in Businesque is, uh, is uh, played uh, in axisymmetric by this rotation, right? This rotation, uh, this swirl component, it moves with the flow, so it acts very similarly to, to the weight uh, in, uh, in Businex. So there is a quite uh, strong analogy, which has been, of course, known, known for probably to Businex already. Um, and uh, so, so we are asking what happens after the singularity and uh, our suggestion is that uh, the singularity starts propagating inside the domain, okay? So it kind of germinates at the boundary and then it will start propagating inside the domain. So we did some uh, simulations on this, but of course uh, here uh, I will, we have a scenario and uh, it's not the same situation and in this, as is this in these previous calculations because now our target object is no longer smooth okay so so, so one has to be one has to be uh, so so what i what i will report is the following so we have a certain scenario in mind okay and we were trying by calculation to find if there are obstacles to that uh, scenario Okay, so we tried uh, the, the maximum resolution and everything, uh, 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 adaptive mesh and all kinds of, and 
my report is we did not find any obstacles okay to uh, to the to the scenario so that's that's all i'm claiming okay i i'm claiming i'm not uh, this is not like a hundred percent that we are sure that uh, this is the this is the case i will be claiming and i will show you some pictures i my claim is okay we did not find any obstacles uh, which we see numerically to our scenario so what is our scenario? So you have, let's, let's think in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, Businex for a second. We have heavy fluid, heavy fluid here, light fluid uh, here. And so in, uh, in the uh, uh, Guolu and Tom House singularity, what happens is that this heavy fluid is kind of like sliding along the bottom here. They, uh, they meet here, okay? The, the points which were at the boundary, they stay at the boundary and uh, they, they meet here. So what we are conjecturing is that once they, once they uh, or at least maybe conjecturing is even, uh, even uh, stronger. So, so I mean, proposing uh, to investigate this possibility. Okay, that's, that's our kind of attitude essentially. That, that these, uh, this uh, uh, this opening here will start closing like that. Okay, the fluid, the light fluid, will be ejected here, and uh, the singularity will kind of uh, remind uh, like a zipper closing here, and uh, it will be propagating. Uh, it will be propagating inside. A good thing about this scenario is that the zipper will be closing not as straight lines, right? There are some, for example, in SQG, people were predicting a singularity scenario and there, there, there kind of, uh, there, there was a similar thing like two, uh, two segments kind of closing and, and touching, but they were closing as a linear segment here. And, and that gives you some strong obstacle to, to single. Here, the zipper is, uh, is closing kind of gradually so that uh, the, the light fluid is being ejected uh, gradually. Okay, that's, that's an important uh, feature here. Now, uh, at the level of Businesk, uh, the, the singularity may not appear to be, uh, uh, to be very strong, but if you go back to the axisymmetric uh, situation when you have rotation on one side of singularity and on the other side of singularity, then this, you, you will have this uh, zipper here. And uh, on this side, the fluid will rotate in one direction. On the other side, the fluid will rotate in the opposite direction. So what you will have here is really a vortex sheet where the, where the velocity will have a discontinuity. Of course, vortex sheet is, uh, is in general a very unstable object, but here it is stabilized by uh, symmetries. So you impose some symmetries which stabilize the object. So the way we, the, I'm running out of time, so let me just go through that very quickly. The way we did the calculation is we added artificial viscosity to this, and then for each artificial viscosity, we did, a, or I should say Luo, Luo did, uh, he did uh, the calculation a fully resolved calculation. So you use adaptive mesh and uh, all, all the tricks of numerical analysis. It's, it's a very difficult uh, calculation, but you hopefully achieve for each viscosity, you achieve a full resolution of, uh, of uh, the situation. And then we, did, uh, then we did the calculations for various values of nu, starting with 10 to the minus four, all the way up to 10 to the minus six. And we were looking at the trend. What you see in uh, do do you hit some obstacle to in as you as you uh, as you lower velocity? Do you see some obstacle to this uh, to this scenario that you you would hit some some trend where you see that uh, that uh, the scenario would be disrupted? And we did not see any. The, the, I, I show you some pictures. So this is. Uh, this is the level sets of, uh, of this uh, function uh, of the rotation, essentially. These are the level sets of uh, rotation. So that is the smooth initial datum. And then 
as uh, you see, it's, it's moving towards, uh, to, this is uh, where the singularity will first appear. It's moving in this direction. This is just after the singularity appeared, the, the uh, Tom Howe and Google singularity appear like this. So you have uh, infinite gradient of U1 at uh, this point. And then you see it, uh, it starts uh, propagating in this, uh, in this uh, direction. This is, uh, this is the, the vortex sheet, uh, which is here. And we do this for all these uh, values of uh, viscosities. And this is, for example, what you see uh, at, uh, the, uh, at the uh, original radius. So at the uh, radius R at the boundary, this is essentially the, the, the swirl and these are solutions for various uh, values of viscosities. So the, the cutoff here is imposed by, uh, by the viscosity, okay? And you see the, you, the, the trend is, uh, is very clear that there seem, doesn't seem to be any obstacle in the trend. This is at a later radius, again, the same thing. So, so the, the message is, okay, our calculation did not see any obstacle to this uh, scenario. Here you see the derivative of uh, this, uh, of this um, uh, rotation. This is the position of, uh, of uh, the, the closure of the zipper, so to speak, in this uh, region. The zipper is already closed. Here it is uh, closing. And again, the dependence on nu is uh, very nice. In fact, uh, this, th there, is a, th there is a pure power law, for example, in this uh, derivative. This is the log plot. You see it's, uh, it's uh, kind of linear in, uh, in uh, log uh, uh, new, so uh, we th there seems to be this explicit uh, dependence. Again, we don't see any obstacle to to the scenario. This is it's of course we use adaptive mesh and everything. This is uh, the mesh, uh, and this is the picture. If if uh, this proposal is correct, uh, and I should uh, I should emphasize again that it is uh, it is a proposal. The vortex sheet is known to be very unstable, right? You have Kelvin Helmholtz instability. There is a work of uh, C.G. Wu where she proved uh, essentially that uh, the, the, if the initial uh, datum is a vortex sheet is well posed only if uh, the thing is analytic. And so, so this is the structure. If this, our suggestion is correct, which you, which you see here, it will be extremely unstable. So presumably the solution, when you leave the symmetry class, which stabilizes it, okay? So you, you have a symmetry class, which stabilizes it. When you leave this class, presumably uh, the, the solution may not even be continuous at, uh, at uh, this point. So that's, uh, that's all I have to say. Thanks very much. <laughs>